Hey guys, we're going to talk to you today about polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. Uh, this is a very common diagnosis. We see people every day in the office. We have a lot of questions from patients about this topic. First thing we're going to talk about is the sort of this, the symptoms, how you make the diagnosis, then we'll talk about treatment. First off, let's talk about what does this really mean, polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's not any one thing. Uh, there are sort of four classic things that are associated with and ultimately allow you to make the diagnosis. Menstrual irregularity, so infrequent periods typically. Signs of what we call hirsutism, which can either be increased acne or facial abdominal hair. Obesity is usually part of it, but not always. A typical appearance of the ovaries on the ultrasound, which is where this name polycystic ovaries comes from. One thing I want to dispel right off the bat is it doesn't actually mean that the person's ovaries have cysts. And this is a really common misconception. A lot of times patients come in and they say they had an ultrasound and they have polycystic ovaries and therefore they have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And that's not true either. So it's really important to understand that it's just one piece of the puzzle and no one thing in this um, syndrome is really going to be the thing that makes the diagnosis or breaks it. Typically you're going to see people have two or three of these things. Some people only have two. Uh, some people have all four. Um, but the point is if someone walks in and is just has an ultrasound that says they have poly, polycystic ovaries, it doesn't mean they have the syndrome. Probably the two most common things that I see in the office are someone having infrequent periods, so they're having a period every two or three months, something like that. Uh, and sometimes longer, and then also typically they are overweight, uh, but not always. Oftentimes you'll see a little increased facial or abdominal hair. Um, you can often find evidence for elevated testosterone uh, when you draw blood, and that is pretty routine to do. There's a couple other simple blood tests that we would do. Make sure this is not a sign of thyroid dysfunction. And also there's one other adrenal abnormality we check what's called a 17-hydroxyprogesterone level, and that rules out adrenal dysfunction as a potential source of the elevated androgens. Other people just have infrequent periods. They're not overweight. They show no signs of androgen excess, no increased facial hair or acne, and then you do an ultrasound, and sure enough, you'll see they have the typical polycystic ovary appearance. There's a picture of one of those right here, and uh, so really you need two Typically, you'll see people have two or three of these features. Like I said before, some people will have all four. Um, the bottom line is it's a clinical diagnosis. There's not one single blood test you can do, and there's not one single ultrasound test that you can do that guarantees the diagnosis. You know, once we've got an idea that this is the right diagnosis based on history and physical, we've ruled out other things like thyroid, other adrenal dysfunction. Um, there are rare... Um, there are rare tumors that can cause sudden increases in facial hair. There's situations if somebody who all of a sudden never before had it, but now they do. They're having to shave they never did before on their face, for example. And also, um, maybe their voice is getting deep or something like that. Then you got to work those people up for um, these rare tumors. Once you've got the diagnosis made, then it's all about, well, what do you do for treatment? And the number one thing is actually weight loss. Most people are overweight who have PCOS, not all. And even losing five or 10% of a patient's current body weight can be enough to make their periods go back to normal. So that's the number one thing, diet and exercise. And it doesn't have to be massive amounts of weight loss. Like I said, five, 10% is often all it takes. That is a number one recommendation for everybody. And then the second thing you start to think about is are you someone who wants to get pregnant now? Uh, are you someone who does not want to get pregnant now? Because the, the treatments can be different in that situation. Once you're talking about infertility, then you talk about ovulation induction. So there's medications that we can use in those situations. The one that's most effective, the one that's proven to be the best is clomiphene or clomid. And there's lots of people out there who are still prescribing metformin in uh, patients with PCOS. Uh, and it's based on the idea that people with PCOS typically also will show signs of insulin resistance. So they may have a little higher glucose. They may be pre-diabetic. If you draw an insulin level, it's often elevated. Uh, based on that basic information, some st early studies were done that looked at using metformin to help people's periods come back to normal without other meds. 
it does improve spontaneous menstruation. However, big studies really have not shown an improved rate of what we call live birth rate. So you got pregnant, you took a baby home. Uh, metformin really does not improve the odds there. So I really don't recommend it. If someone's taking it, I'm not going to argue with them about it, but I'm going to explain that uh, this may not be helpful. It's not hurting anything, I don't think. But it's just not the number one thing to do. The number one thing to do is to induce ovulation. Clomid's number one. That's where all the data is. Femera or letrozole is not approved for this situation, but it's used very calmly in infertility, and that is your second line drug. It's not wrong to add metformin after that if you're still having trouble getting somebody to ovulate, but it's not a big part of what I do every day. I really don't check insulin levels. If uh, if someone's over if someone's obese or overweight, it's smart to at a minimum check a fasting glucose and a hemoglobin A1C or even do a two-hour glucose test to make sure they don't have diabetes. But aside from that, I don't worry too much about insulin levels and really don't recommend metformin routinely. If you have a patient who is not wanting to get pregnant currently, birth control pills are one of the best things for regulating their periods so that they come on a more regular basis. It also helps reducing some of the effects of the hyperandrogenism, so less acne, less facial hair. Now, it won't make facial hair go away that's already there, but it can slow the new growth of new hair follicles. There are medications you can use as second line that are considered anti-androgens, spironolactone, for example, and that's usually used second after birth control pills have been on board for a few months if symptoms aren't improving. It may also help with one that's less common in younger women, but you do sometimes see, which is kind of a male pattern baldness where you get hair loss in this area here. So when that's the case, sometimes spironolactone could be helpful there. But again, the big thing is diet and exercise and weight loss because more than anything, that's going to reduce some of the long-term effects. People with PCOS also have increased risk of heart disease and what we call a metabolic syndrome where you have high cholesterol, high glucose, risk for diabetes. All that goes together ultimately is risk for heart disease. So another reason to try to get this under control at a younger age rather than letting it go. People who are overweight with PCOS also have a higher risk of sleep apnea. So screening for sleep apnea symptoms in terms of things like daytime sleepiness, headaches, uh, if a partner is there that can tell them they're snoring, maybe they're not breathing all the time, those people probably need a sleep study. Another thing that has become popular are various diets, whether it's low carb or high carb or high protein or low protein or paleo or vegan or whatever. And really, it's been studied and no particular diet is any better than any other as long as ultimately you get the weight loss. So if you find that one diet works better for you, and it leads to weight loss, then that's great because that's what really needs to happen. It's The concept has been, well, if you're, if you're insulin resistant, you're glucose intolerant, that if you cut out the carbs, that's going to be a good thing. And although it makes sense, they're just the studies have really not shown any change in the outcomes. So I don't think you have to stick to that. But if you do go low carb and it works for you, then great. Keep it up. Don't change. But if it's not working for you, then maybe you need to look at a different diet. Of course, everybody knows somebody who says, They've dieted, they've exercised, they've changed their lifestyle, they're not losing weight, now what? So if you're in the category of obesity or morbid obesity and you've already done these lifestyle modifications and you're not losing weight or not losing enough weight, it's not wrong to think about weight loss medications. There are several out there now, many of which are new and safer than Phentermine, which is pretty popular years ago, but I personally don't prescribe. Uh, but there's other meds out there that are safer. Uh, bariatric surgery, in other words, weight loss surgery. For people who are morbidly obese, the data is very clear that you can see weight loss of up to 100 pounds. You can see complete reversal of things like diabetes and PCOS. So I think in that, in that population, it definitely makes sense. And of course, it varies a lot for your insurance. Does it cover it or not? But it's worth checking into if you've already done all these other things. So that's just kind of a brief rundown of PCOS, how I think about it when I'm talking to a patient in the office. I hope this information is helpful to you. If you have questions, please put them in the comments. Appreciate you watching and I hope you guys have a great day. Take care.